This episode is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Head to cardkingdom.com slash studies to pick up Wrath of God, Damnation, and any of the other apocalypse-inducing board wipes featured in this video. Many of these cards have variants available that match the look and feel of your favorite deck, ranging from Kev Walker's Destructive Duo to Titus Lunter's version for the Amonkhet Invocations. Whichever you choose, Card Kingdom provides high-quality products and responsive customer service, and will ship your entire order all in one package. This episode is sponsored by Coalesce Apparel and Design. With the release of March of the Machine, the MTG Jam collection has expanded to include three new team-ups. These new designs feature Galta and Mavrin, Kogla and Yadaro, and my personal favorites, Borborygmos and Fibblethip. Head to Coalesce to pick up one of these fun new t-shirts and snag a Ristic Studies playmat or sticker on the way out. Hats are in stock too. Use code STUDIES at checkout for 10% off your order. Central to the setting of Coheed and Cambria's fifth concept album, Year of the Black Rainbow, is a sprawling void that rips across the universe of Heaven's Fence. Citizens believe the phenomenon to be an omen from God, a protest against the eminent usurping powers. On the cover of the accompanying novel stands a statue of the story's antagonist, and behind him, stretching across the sky, is the paradoxical namesake of the record. The music video for the anthemic single Here We Are Juggernaut showcases the arrival of this vast emptiness over New York City. The album concludes with the title track, The Black Rainbow, a seven-minute studio piece that embraces the dark and moody atmosphere of the record. About two minutes in, the song erupts into a soaring, circular refrain as Claudio Sanchez repeats the lines, It's over, it's over, it's all coming apart. For four minutes, the band sits and stews in this slow and sludgy march as the cavernous ambiance continues to widen. Then, as the layers of guitar and drums and noise pile on, a swirling howl arrives and oscillates atop the massive wall of sound. And suddenly, without warning, it cuts to silence. There will be a vast shout and then a vaster silence. This illustration by Drew Tucker aims directly at that vaster silence. Nothing is moving. You can almost hear the air. In the foreground lies an assembly of anonymous death and decay. Winds of Wrath is one of many magic cards that destroy all creatures. The name, perhaps intentionally, is a clever homonym of Wrath, an allusion to the very first card to ever do it and the de facto shorthand for spells that enact similar effects. Wrath of God is as old as magic itself. Alpha mixed pagan iconography with the high fantasy aesthetics of Dungeons and Dragons, then peppered in references to historical events and citations from world literature and poetry. Alpha juxtaposed wizards and castles with angels and demons, and populated its world with animals that seemed torn from the pages of national park brochures. Translating this assortment of source material into game pieces resulted in top-down designs like Lightning Bolt, Raise Dead, and Wrath of God. These cards would help define the parameters of their respective colors for decades to come. Wrath of God, as the name suggests, is an overtly religious magic card. The myth of the Last Judgment has permeated the visual arts for centuries. Michelangelo's work in the Sistine Chapel is among the most cited, but the motif is central to the Catholic and Christian imagination, and it reappears throughout their countless places of worship. Tales of these world-ending catastrophes correspond to the branch of theology called eschatology. 
These works of art often feature imagery of mass suffering beneath an idealized form of a savior. Many of them are oriented vertically to reflect the spatial metaphors of heaven and hell. Even without knowing the details, the narrative is explicit to viewers. This is by design. Quentin Hoover's Wrath of God, made not for a cathedral but for a card game, depicts an amorphous mound of bodies piled up across a battlefield, as an abstract face of a higher power glares angrily down upon them. In the original alpha set of Magic, writes Rob Bachman, white was the color of egalitarian destruction. Wrath of God does not take sides. In Hoover's painting, both armies have been leveled as one in death. Appearing in Alpha as well was another white-aligned sorcery of mass destruction in Armageddon. The etymology of this term is a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew, Harmageddon, a prophesied place in which armies would gather for battle during the end times. Such a place exists, and existed. Tel Megiddo, situated in northern Israel, has been over the centuries a city-state, as well as a contested battleground, and now stands as a holy site of archaeological intrigue. I wonder if Jesper Meerforce knew all this when he painted Armageddon in 1993. In his depiction, skulls litter a charred wasteland preluding a desolate city. A lingering sun hangs in a black sky. Maybe this illustration was inspired by the myth. The imagery certainly fits. Then again, as professors Natasha and Anthony O'Hare argue in picturing the apocalypse, the term Armageddon has become an all-purpose cliché, used almost as a knee-jerk reaction to describe any environmental, nuclear, or financial disaster, real or imagined. Like Wrath of God, Armageddon promises total, unbiased destruction. It is significant to me that both of these iconic cards appeared for the first time in Alpha, that Richard Garfield and company implemented mass removal spells from the outset, and that they dress the mechanic in historical myths of the apocalypse. This detail speaks to an aesthetic and narrative quality of what magic sought to achieve at its outset. Casting Wrath of God gave players a taste of omnipotence in 1993, and the ability to ruinate a world has since become a mainstay of the play experience. Since Alpha, countless iterations and imitations of Wrath of God have surfaced across all card types. The two key words, destroy all, are viscerally connected to that sense of egalitarian destruction. In contrast, cards like Merciless Eviction tap into a separate sensation in-game. Exiling feels like creating a parallel plane, a hidden void, where creatures perpetually exist but remain out of grasp, elsewhere. Visions of vacant cities from the first month of the global pandemic represent this difference. We weren't unmade, we were just momentarily gone. Conversely, destroy all creatures. Antiquities released in March of 1994. As Magic's second standalone expansion, this set aimed to tell its own story a tale of two boring brothers whose feud culminated in the detonation of a high fantasy atomic bomb. Unleashing the power of the Golgothian Silex sent Dominaria into an ice age that lasted millennia. The blast shattered the continent and shifted its tectonic plates and suspended the plane in a perpetual winter. The explosion of the Silex was not a holy smite from a higher power, Rather, it was a crude display of technology that brought consequences informed by scientific research. If Alpha departed from theological events to represent total annihilation, antiquities and subsequent expansions embraced more secular source material from the 20th century to characterize their depictions of the apocalypse. <laughs> Thirty years of developing magic has produced similar weapons akin to the Silex. Every now and then, R&D concepts a new artifact that gives players the power to destroy the world. 
Oblivion Stone from Mirrodin lends choice to whom and what survive in the form of fate counters. Scour Glass makes its choice for you. Only artifacts and lands persist, which imbues this card's narrative with a nod to the concept of time. Plague Boiler ruminates for a few turns before unleashing its life-ending disease. This one has a bit of a comedic slant to it, aided in part by its illustration. World Slayer turns Annihilation into a smoldering sword that destroys everything, including its wielder, when it strikes the opponent. And Nivineral's Disc, which debuted in Alpha alongside Wrath of God and Armageddon, requires players to wait at least one turn before eliminating most of the battlefield. I like the tension this brings to a game. Like priming Samus to full power, you become a time bomb already ticked, aware to everyone around you. With Larry Niven's disc, the eventuality of destruction is not a matter of if, but when. Sometimes the game's heroes and villains serve as the harbingers of upheaval. End Hostilities destroys all creatures. Jason Rainville's illustration showcases a Jeskai monk unleashing a burst of energy through the palm of their hand upon a cavalry of Mardu horsemen. Elish Norn in Rout plays with a similar motif. Vanquish the Horde depicts Audric looming over the massacre, conflicted with the burden of such violence. Akroma and Kirtar and Bantu have all inflicted impartial eradication onto their respective planes. As has Hidetsugu, who became destruction manifest as the vessel of the all-consuming. Chris Cold's haunting painting shows a floating shade intertwining with a sea of black clouds. Planeswalkers, the game's demigods, also carry world-reckoning potential. Many of them are templated with conditional wraths, like Elspeth Sun's champion, and Liliana Death's Majesty. These characters possess superpowers a cut above the rest, and often that potency is flaunted through game-ending displays of destruction. This power makes for especially theatrical moments in trailers for event sets. Before Planeswalkers, there was the progeny of the Maelstrom, the Avatar of Rebirth. Like the boy Akira, Child of Alara symbolically suggests that the genesis of a new world requires the raising of its ancestor. Extreme weather events also signal annihilation in magic. Flash fires and funeral pyres remind us that the fantasy of this card game is informed by the reality of brutal climate catastrophes. Doomscar and Maelstrom Pulse, on the other hand, entertain the idea of overlapping two separate worlds and forcing them to collide, a natural disaster only possible in a multiverse of make-believe. The former card alludes to the arrival of Ragnarok. Norse mythology was equally fascinated with eschatological calamities. It is true, and we must remember, that every culture in the world has told their own myths of creation and destruction. Although the mechanisms vary, destroying all creatures most consistently reappears time and again as a white sorcery. The theme of calling upon the impersonal hand of an invisible higher power has taken shape on dozens of cards since 1993, and in effect, a unifying visual language has emerged. Here is Planar Cleansing by Michael Komark. In the painting appear a myriad of tiny silhouettes being torn asunder by an ethereal white light. These helpless bodies are drifting and forming a trail toward its epicenter. A distant castle lends an idea of scale. Day of Judgment by Vincent Prost departs from a similar art description, and its name pays homage to the biblical events that inspired it. Hour of Reckoning and Righteous Fury and Sun Scour all use that same glowing white light to engulf the primary figures in the foreground. What may be the most iconic example of a composition using these conventions came in 2001, when Wrath of God was reprinted in 7th edition, featuring new art by Kev Walker. This painting is so evocative. 
A hypnotizing ball of light hovers in the background like a supernova, recalling Katsuhiro Otomo's masterwork Akira from the 1980s. Repeatedly throughout the manga, turning the page reveals an enormous panel of white light rendered in negative space. The emptiness radiates from the book, and over time it becomes a signature stylistic element of its storytelling. So many magic cards attempt to use white light to similar effect, white light as a weapon, a tool of extermination and cleansing. Sometimes this purifying white light erupts from the figures themselves. Destroy all creatures happens from within, like a lethal exorcism, as towering beams shoot into the sky above. Other times, artists explore the moments after the world has faced cataclysm. These paintings are often much eerier. Mark Fishman's work for March of Souls serves as a spiritual successor to Quentin Hoover's concept, where battlefields become bodies. Life's Finale by Svetlin Velenov offers a macabre scene of desolation filled with decrepit husks. Ron Spencer's Wrath of God from the 2007 Player Awards takes us into the impact zone as the deadly white light recedes back into the sky. In the surrounding area are corpses petrified like those unearthed at Pompeii. Neo-Tokyo is full of similar craters, scars left over from the bombardment of transorbital lasers. Ron Spencer also painted Damnation for the same series, which depicts a toxic wasteland shrouded in noxious green gases. A rotting horse stretches over a jagged rock as bodies decay in its periphery. This card is reminiscent of The Triumph of Death by Peter Bruegel the Elder from circa 1562, in which a horde of skeletons terrorize a Dutch countryside. This gigantic painting, hanging in the Museo del Prado in Madrid, is a morally charged work in which every social institution is conquered by mortality. There is no visible hierarchy, nothing supersedes the egalitarian destruction. Ian Miller's Damnation continues with this tradition of showing a hellish wasteland overrun by death. Hidden behind the card frame lies an ocean of tormented souls. Dantesque harpies with glowing red eyes torture the suffering from above. An unearthly purple fills its backdrop. This piece, like much of Miller's work, is saturated with intense line work that invigorates the details of its dismal imagery. Before the bomb, the apocalypse looked like this. It looked like the central painting from John Martin's Triptych, a sublime volcano. It looked like the sketches from Albrecht Dürer of the four horsemen vehemently galloping to bring the end. It looked like the 90 scenes woven across six giant tapestries hanging in the Chateau d'Angers of many-headed beasts and demons and dragons. After the bomb, the apocalypse stopped looking so human. Kev Walker painted Damnation in 2007 as a companion piece to Wrath of God, centered in black. The characteristic wash of white light is absent in this piece. In its place is a howling void, something like the black rainbow, or the nothing, or whatever supermassive entity swallows stars in space. Since 2007, Wrath of God has been reprinted dozens of times with a handful of new illustrations, each one bearing the signature flash of violent white light. Spells of similar effect have ventured into new design space, each one imitating or iterating on the central tenet of destroying all creatures. Poetic flavor text often accompanies these cards. At times, these short lines read more poignant and profound than is deserved by a fantasy card game. At its essence, magic is part of a cultural milieu that continues to reimagine the end of the world. As Natasha O'Hare remarks, part of the power and longevity of Revelation's images is that they symbolize fundamental aspects of our existence and experience, which transcends both the time and the religious mythological context in which they were originated. Although it's been decades since the game took direct inspiration from any real-world religious iconography, Card names like Wrath of God and Armageddon and Apocalypse persist. 
That last term, from the Greek word meaning to reveal, is particularly resonant, always present in the minds of those who name cards. But magic also offers hope and embraces the Ouroboros of destruction breeding creation. From the Ashes by Karl Kapinski is among my favorite paintings that symbolize such renewal. Like in Akira, there seems to be an incessant human desire to reconstruct and rebuild after catastrophe, no matter how dire the events that prelude it. As fascinated as we are about the end of the world, there is always a lingering curiosity about what comes after. Epilogues become prologues, plants spring from hollowed out ruins, baby grizzlies discover new playgrounds. A vast silence becomes a precursor of peace. The final sponsor of this episode is the Johannes Voss Playmats collection on Kickstarter. Johannes Voss is a brilliant and seasoned painter whose illustrations command vibrant colors and inspiring imagery. This project showcases his signature style, with paintings like Gift of Orzova and The Prismatic Bridge available on extended artwork playmats and fitted with normal or stitched edge treatments. This project also debuts five new pieces, including the Radiant Plains from Dominaria United. The flowers here are just so lovely. Follow my affiliate link below to support the Kickstarter. The project has already surpassed 300% of its funding goal and will still be accepting late backers for a limited time with stretch goals to follow. Pledge now, then celebrates like Gallia of the Endless Revel. The aesthetic conventions of wrath effects go beyond their depictions in art. They become equally apparent in the poetics of flavor text, and in the card frames, and even in the rules text itself. The language of Wrath of God has changed as many times as its accompanying illustrations over the years. The original printing carried a passive voice, all creatures in play are destroyed and cannot regenerate. This format displaces the responsibility of the act onto an impersonal higher power, and the sentence reads as a matter-of-fact and almost prophetic statement. By using this grammatical phrasing, the sense of control and agency is distanced. Revised kept this format but offered a different verb in buried, which was then changed to the imperative in 4th edition. Bury all creatures, however, does not carry the same weight as destroy all creatures, which debuted in 6th edition and has remained the rules-appropriate verbiage since. The subtle editorial change in 10th edition of center justifying the statement has become my favorite way to represent the text. It is balanced and aligns symmetrically with the composition in a visually pleasing way. Long before secret layers and showcase frames, Wizards of the Coast produced a series of small-run collector products called From the Vault, which curated a group of cards underneath a unifying theme. One of these was From the Vault Annihilation, published in 2014. The 15 cards that made up the collection included Wrath of God, Armageddon, and Child of Alara, as well as some other heavy hitters like Cataclysm and Decree of Annihilation. Terminus made the list too, bearing that blinding white light that neatly extends into the miracle card frame. The series will always be a bit nostalgic for me. I love the idea of collecting cards around a central concept, like a greatest hits album of sorts. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new.